All right, here we are with a lesson all about physical properties. Um, physical properties are different than chemical properties because when we determine these types of properties about substances, we do not change the chemical makeup of the substance. So here's an example. If we want to find the boiling point of a sample of water, we do not change the chemical makeup after we boil it. Water molecules will still have the same chemical formula that we know is H2O. Okay, so this is very important that physical properties do not change the chemical makeup of the substance. We're also going to talk about chemical properties, where measuring chemical properties would change the chemical makeup, but that's going to come in our chemistry unit. So for right now, we're talking about physical properties, and there's two types. We're going to talk about the first branch and then the second branch of this flow chart. The first type of physical property is what is known as a qualitative physical property. And a qualitative physical property has two things that we're going to talk about. First of all, it describes a physical property of the substance. And it does not involve a number and a unit. So some examples of this are found in the chart below. Um, so these are some qualitative physical properties. So when we talk about an object being in a form of a solid, a liquid, or a gas, we're referring to a physical qualitative property known as its state. Okay, this is well known to many of you, um, the state of that the matter is in. Okay, so something else um, that we could talk about, a qualitative property, um, would be something navy blue or baby blue is better than blue. So this would be color. We're talking about color here. And um, let's be very descriptive when we describe the color of an object. No color, we should point out, is not white and is not necessarily clear. No color we describe as colorless. All right. Um, which is quite different than white or clear. All right. Now we'll talk about clarity. Okay, which is how well an object transmits light or allows light to be transmitted. So the first clarity, uh, the first way that we could describe is by saying an object is transparent. Okay, now this means, unlike colorless, transparent means the object is clear. So you can see through it. Light easily passes through the sample. It could still be colored. So an example of this would be a window. And we don't necessarily have to talk about just a clear uh, colorless window. We could also talk about a stained glass window. Because that also allows light to transmit. Um, and very often that those windows are colored. Okay. Um, another type of clear substance would be sunglasses. The lenses in your sunglasses are certainly not colored, uh, colorless, but they are clear. All right, so moving along, um, a little bit further down, if something is not transparent, but it still allows some light to pass through, we call that translucent. And this is what we mean by foggy, when something is foggy. So some light passes through, fuzzy images are seen. So an example of this, two examples, would be wax paper. Wax paper is certainly translucent. Um, but also uh, frosted glass.
And you would recognize that certainly living in Canada in the winter, um, we would recognize that frosted glass, yes, it allows some light to, to pass through, but we wouldn't be able to see clearly through to the other side. The last uh, and farthest from transparent, so all the way down the spectrum to the other side then, is where no light passes through, and we call this opaque. No light passes through the sample. And so this, you know, would be something like a wooden door. Or alternatively, an aluminum can. No light gets through these, these objects. So again, just to re to rehash, clarity means how easily light is transmitted, and we have three modes: transparent, translucent, and opaque. All right. Another physical property moving down this list is odor. Odors can be detected um, only if gas molecules from the sample attached to receptors in your nose. Okay, so the only time we smell something is if there are gas molecules being released from the substance. Okay, so this includes um, smells like faint or strong, sweet, pleasant, medicinal, flowery, um, and strong foul odors like rotten eggs. That is described as being pungent. Ammonia would be another uh, smell that we would describe as being pungent. So odor is another physical property. Something that's shiny, um, or how shiny something is, is called its luster. And the luster of an object is very often associated with metals. Okay. So if something is not metal-like, instead of using luster, we might talk about something not being shiny, but something being glossy or reflective, um, polished or iridescent. And so the opposite of something that is lustrous would be something that's dull or matte or flat. Okay, so um, if luster describes how shiny something is, then the word that we use to describe how something feels, whether it's gritty, granular, this is known as texture. Okay, and so we have different textures. Think about sandpaper as an example of something that is very gritty. Um, and we could also talk about the texture of something being very smooth. Okay, so workability is another one of these physical properties that really comes down to uh, talking about metals. And workability, there are two things, A and B. The first is what is known as malleable. And malleable means that something can be hammered into a thin sheet. And so the substance gold which has the chemical formula AU, is the most malleable substance. So it's easiest of all the metals to be hammered into a thin sheet. Another property, though, that talks about how workable something is, is what's known as duct, uh, duct, um, how ductile something is. And this means uh, when something is very ductile, it can be drawn into a thin wire. Okay. The last physical property we're going to talk about describes how a liquid flows, and this is known as viscosity. Okay. So something like motor oil or maple syrup is more viscous than water, which means it doesn't flow as easily as water does. Um, other things that are that flow more uh, readily than water are things like gasoline 
or alcohol. These are less viscous than water, and they flow much easier. So these are our qualitative physical properties, okay? And you can see them here. We're going to now turn our attention to the other side of this flow chart. The other type of physical property would be a quantitative physical property. And of course, if qualitative physical properties do not describe and do not use a number, these ones do. So quantitative physical properties, again, describe a physical property of the substance. And they involve a number and a standard SI unit. And you'll be um, very familiar with SI units once we talk a little bit more about them. So here are three quantitative physical properties. The first is mass. Okay. This is, and this is an important definition for you to remember, so I'm going to highlight this. Mass is an indirect measure of the number of atoms that are in a sample. Okay. Uh, and this is an important description to remember. Nickel, like, like a nickel, if we, if we were to estimate how, how much mass this would have, we'd say, well, maybe about 5 grams. And similarly, an adult male, we would say, well, about maybe 72.6 kilograms. This would be a very, very specific estimation. Another quanti quantitative physical property is volume. And volume measures the amount of space that a sample occupies. This is another important definition that we'll highlight. We're going to talk much more about mass and volume in the coming days. So a couple of things that you may be very aware of is that a can of pop is 355 milliliters. Standard volume. And a bag of milk that you would buy in the grocery store would be four liters. Again, a standard measure. So these are masses and volumes. Last, um, we have length, width, or height. And this measures the dimension of an object. And so perhaps the height of a man, we might say, is 195 centimeters. And if we were going to estimate the thickness of a dime, we might say, well, a little bit bigger than one millimeter, we'd say maybe 1.2 millimeters. So these are some examples of quantitative physical properties. There are some that we call characteristic. And the reason that we call them characteristic is because they're unique. They're unique for every single sample that we have. And so therefore, they can be used to identify a sample. So typical characteristics, um, physical quantitative characteristics, are things such as the melting point, the boiling point, and the density of an object. So we know, for example, for water, its melting point, which is also its freezing point, is zero degrees Celsius. And we know that to be true. We also know its boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. And for some of you, you may be already well aware that the density of water is 1.0 grams per millimeter per, per milliliter. So these three values right here are so important that we're going to ask you to make sure that you've got these memorized. We'll be working with these quite a bit, so it won't be difficult to memorize. But here are some different values. Of course, iron has a very, very high melting point and an even higher boiling point. Very, very high. And it's got a much higher density. And you can see that 
every single one of these values for all of these substances is different. And so one of the, one of the important things about characteristic physical uh, properties is that they would separate and help us to identify unknown substances. So that's all we're going to talk about today when it comes to physical properties. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an activity in class to help you use some of these and to help you identify them.